So, good morning and welcome to the 33rd and last meeting of 2014 of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. Before we move to the first item on the agenda, I'm reminding those present to switch off mobile phones as they may affect the broadcasting system. However, members, of course, are uh, clear to use tablets for the purposes of the meeting. So, agenda item one is a decision on taking business. Oh, we have apologies from Cara Hilton. I'm sorry, I should have announced that just now. Um, and agenda item one is decisions on taking business in private, uh, which is item five. Today, are we agreed? We're agreed. Thank you very much. Item two is subordinate legislation. Uh, the second item is for the committee to consider the following negative instrument, the conservation of salmon annual close time and catch and release Scotland regulations 2014 SSI 2014-327. Members should note that no motion to annul has been received in relation to the instrument and the committee received several written submissions on this SSI which are included in the annex to the paper. I refer members to the paper and the submissions and ask for comments that you may wish to make. I welcome Nigel Don to the committee for this item and uh, would appreciate hearing from him first as one of the constituency members involved. Thank you, convener, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to do this. And the only unfamiliar part about this is that I'm the wrong side of the table, but uh, it's good to see you all again. Uh, this relates to salmon fishing um, by all methods. And as members will be very well aware, there are many anglers in my constituency, but there's also a significant salmon netting operation. Members will also have seen that there's a great deal of correspondence about this. I really just want to pick out what I think is the, the most important issue from that, and I think it can be reduced to a very small number of words. Insofar as close time affects those who fish, then it seems to me that there is a slight difference between the netsmen and those who have an angling interest. Uh, there is an opportunity for anglers to carry on fishing and to put the fish back into the water. There is therefore some economic activity and benefit uh, within the angling community. On the other hand, if you're not allowed to take a fish out of the water, the netsman can do precisely nothing. There is an economic opportunity for those with an angling interest there is zero economic interest for those with a netting interest. All they have is their costs. Now, there's also a proportionality issue in there, simply because if anglers can take fish and then put them back, then there is, I think, a recognition that some of those fish will die, whether they've been injured or simply exhausted in the process. I don't know what the mortality is. I think I've seen a figure of 18%. I have no idea how robust that number is. Um, but nonetheless, there will be some. And again, there's a certain inequity that the netsmen who admittedly are going to kill every fish they take can take precisely none, whereas the angling community can necessarily kill some. Um, and so there's a, a, an equity issue in here somewhere. Now, all I would want to put to the committee is that in your response to the government at some point, could you please make those points and as a consequence of them, make the point that to the netsmen, wherever they might be, and they're not all in my constituency, of course, there is no income whatsoever derived from a point where they cannot catch. But there are, of course, fixed costs, as there are to absolutely every business, indeed most businesses. Uh, all costs are fixed for a short period of time, which is what we're talking about. Uh, and therefore, that takes us straight to the issue of compensation. I think there is a recognition that no compensation need necessarily legally be paid. I'm not sure that's the position, but that seems to be the implication, mm -hmm. I think, to the businessmen in my community. Um, I would simply want, or for them, I would simply want to ask you, could you bring to the government's attention that some compensation might well be entirely appropriate? Uh, quantum of that's not easy to come by, but it looks like the figure of about £10,000 a month is consistent with what's happened before in terms of compensation from the S Board to the netsman. Uh, that would appear to be the right kind of number. Uh, I'm sure the accountants can talk about that. So that's really what I wanted to bring to the committee. Could you please take to the government uh, the point about equity and the appropriateness, I think, of some compensation? 
Thank you for that. Um, Graham Day. Yeah, thanks, Convener. Uh, I have sympathy in principle with any business that's ability to generate income has been impacted upon by legislation. But the fact is, this SSI has been introduced for sound reasons. And there's an argument that says that not only have the netting interest brought this on themselves, it may well provide a future for their businesses which might not be there otherwise. I mean, some boards have been paying netsmen not to work during the spring run. In the case of the South Esk, uh, for example, I think it was £18,000 last year and the year before. Yet it's the SNFA netsmen who walked away from this voluntary arrangement, presumably because it was more lucrative for them to be active during the period than not. I, however, that might impact upon a diminishing asset. And in submissions made to the committee, we, we read claims about mortality rates from catch and release. I think Nigel Don referred to these. But if we take 2013 as an example, and again the South Esk, the register's figures show that 7,159 fish were killed by netsmen whilst 522 were caught by rod, and 77% of those were released. Now, even if every released fish then died, we're still talking about fractions compared to the netting take. And I think the need for this measure before us is, is actually supported by the netting returns, because, again, on the South, South Esk, after 7,159 fish were taken in the nets in 2013, it was just 5,210 this year which, if you accept these figures to be accurate, to me suggests the fish are growing scarcer and scarcer. And in terms of responding to what some might see as a growing crisis, um, I understand the S District Board, for example, which covers a number of rivers in Nigel Don seat and, and one in mine, they've written out to anglers asking them not to kill fish right up until June the 15th this year. So they are responding to the issue, I would suggest. So on the, on the one hand, we have the rod guys through catch and release, and hopefully adherence to this sort of request, they're taking steps to conserve, and the netsmen seem seemingly intent on stepping up their efforts to catch compared to previous years. So, so convener, I, I would suggest that there is an argument for some degree of compensation, I accept that, but there's a far stronger argument for passing this SSI in the long-term interests of anglers and netsmen. Uh, are there other members who wish to say anything at the moment? Certainly. Two words to Graham Day's last sentence, which is and salmon. And I say that because I think at the, at the, at the root of this entire issue is the conservation of a species. And while I can, I, I can understand to a degree where Nigel Don is coming from, and if I was a netsman, I would probably feel quite hard done by, although I also accept Graham Day's point that, that, that they have initiated, if, in a way, this um, action. Um, but, I, but I do think we need to focus on the fact that, that you know, conservation of salmon is at the, the basis of this measure, uh, not, not particularly favouring one sector or another or one stakeholder or another. Thank you. Dave Thompson. Uh, thank you, uh, Convener. Yes, I've listened with interest to what both Nigel and, and Graham have said and indeed uh, Alex. And I, I think um, when you're looking at a subject like this, um, equity, I think, as Nigel says, has got to come into this, and uh, netting for salmon, uh, you know, around the Scottish coast has been going on for centuries. And <clears throat> if you're going to deprive people, basically, of their livelihood, or even part of their livelihood, I, I think it is um, it's sensible and decent to consider some kind of compensation or buyout, or, or however it's done, uh, you know, because otherwise, um, it's, it's unfair and it's wrong, and uh, I'm pretty sure that the, the government uh, will, will listen to that. I certainly, I certainly hope so. The, the second point I would like to, to make is that um, if the, the figures that uh, Graham Day, if the 7,000 uh, fish are not caught, <coughs> all of these fish then swim up the river. Uh, who benefits from that? People uh, further up the river, obviously, riparian owners and, and, and others. So there's a massive benefit to folk. Uh, and I think that needs to be taken into consideration as well uh, in the longer term. I know that there's the fisheries review and, and, and so on. Um, <clears throat> and having access to uh, those 7,000 fish, only 500, I think you said, were, were being caught with a, the rod and line at the moment. There's lots more going up there. We need to look at issues around wider access to, uh, to fishing um, <clears throat> if we're going to be 
taking away somebody's livelihood, allowing the fish to go up, someone else benefits. Well, let's get some public benefit out of it as well. So, I, th I mean, these are just very general comments uh, from me. I am not putting forward any specific details as to how I think that these things should be, uh, you know, dealt with in detail. But I think as broad principles, I, I think we should be looking at that. Thank you. Um, Claudia Beamish. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, I just wanted to highlight a, a figure that was um, given to me by the um, Association of Salmon Fisheries Boards, which is that um, in terms of um, provisional data for 2013, that would indicate that the overall voluntary catch and release rate for salmon was 92% for spring salmon Scotland-wide. And I just wanted to put that um, figure in, into the public domain. But I do think it is an equity issue, and I do think that there, there may well be arguments for compensation. And I think these are things that we should be um, considering, along with all the other very complex issues that are going to come before us in the, in the review. But in the meantime, I, I would be supportive of this, um, this measure going through. Um, I have, uh, as a constituent, uh, James Mackay of Armadale Fisheries. Uh, he's also the chair of the Salmon Net Fishing Association of Scotland. Um, he has uh, given us useful evidence in the past of the uh, cooperation which the netsmen on the North Coast have uh, given to scientific understanding of uh, the movement of salmon. Uh, it was germane to our discussions during the Aquaculture Bill. Um, uh, he suggested that, uh, you know, the rights of netsmen, which are heritable, are something which have to be treated uh, fairly. And uh, to echo what Dave Thompson has said, uh, the questions about compensation must be taken on board by the government if any interference in this comes along. But I point out that in the Wild Fisheries Review, a licensing si system for fishing on rivers, for angling that is, is one of the main proposals. So there will be uh, a stricter uh, view taken of the way in which uh, angling is conducted and organised and maintained. But uh, from the point of view of reciprocity and uh, the need for uh, you know, a fair treatment of people, we have to make sure that the government does take on board these things. However, given that there is talk of a meeting uh, between the government and the Salmon uh, Net Fishing Association of Scotland early in the new year, I would hope that that would allow a clearer view of uh, the situation for the Salmon Netters to be, to, to, to be achieved, but we know also that the government is talking of con uh, consulting on uh, measures which would license uh, the killing of wild salmon and an associated carcass tagging regime. That being said, um, this order um, would deal with the immediate threat to the spring run of salmon, but in the follow-on from that would allow for a fairer understanding of how netsmen should be treated and how rivers should be organised. In that, in, that, in that sense, uh, you know, from my point of view, I want to make sure that the netsmen do not lose out on this at the expense of any other uh, mm. fishery. Mike Russell? I entirely agree with you, and I particularly agree with Dave Thompson. I think there have to be principles applied here. And I think some of those principles include the right to earn a livelihood as opposed to undertake leisure activities, which I think is fairly fundamental and is a, an environmental issue that um, is considered worldwide, if you look at the rights called in other places rights of native communities. I think there is an issue of depriving of livelihood, which uh, should, if it's an action by the state, um, for conservation means, lead to compensation. I don't think there's any doubt about that, uh, but it just depends the level of loss incurred. You know, the total loss of livelihood would obviously require compensation. A smaller loss of livelihood, at least there could be questions about it. But I think there also must be a clarity about what objectives are. If the objective is to sustain a species that is in grave danger, and if that objective is not being adequately met, then further actions will be required. And it is sometimes better to go further than you might go uh, than to do it bit by bit. Because I think if I were a salmon netsman, I would be very concerned that year in, year out, there are new threats to my livelihood and some salmon fishing stations closing down year on year. And therefore, I think there needs to be a clarity about what the long-term future 
of earning a livelihood as a salmon netsman actually is. And I think we owe it to them to look at that squarely in the face and for a decision to be reached. So uh, I think members uh, have uh, spoken. We are obviously the uh, Rural Affairs Climate Change and Environment Committee and climate change and environment are very much at the heart of uh, the threat to this particular species, uh, which we must take very seriously. Um, since there is no uh, motion to annul, um, I guess the answer is that the ministers will have a very clear sight of the committee's views from the official report as this uh, debate has taken place, and that uh, we should therefore move to the point of saying that uh, we agree uh, to make no recommendations in relation to the instrument. Do you agree? Does do um, take a look at the official report of this discussion? We can write to them and uh, remind them that the official report Just, um, is a, a very area of discussion that, uh, on yeah. this matter. Uh, indeed. Uh, I would assume that ministers are quite keen to do so, given their uh, wish to have an early meeting with the uh, Salmon Net Fishing Association of Scotland early in the new year. But yes, to underline it, we can do that, Mr Ferguson. Thank you very much. So we're agreed uh, to make no further comments. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Nigel. Now we move to agenda uh, items related to um, a number of SSIs. The third item today is to consider nine negative instruments as set out in the paper. Uh, members should note that no motion to annul has been received in relation to these instruments. I refer members to the, the papers. Um, if there are any comments about any one of these items, perhaps you could indicate that just now, because I'd be tend to move uh, towards dealing with the Mont Blanc. But uh, let's take whatever comes up. Mike Russell, you have one. Don't want to delay the committee doing it on block. I simply want to make a point about the plant health import inspection fees, Scotland Regulations 2014. Little, if any, attention in this uh, SSI seems to have been paid to the rights and needs of those who are actually producing the plants. And going through the list, then clearly there are those who are doing so who um, are undertaking activities such as fair trade activities. So I do hope at least there is some consideration given to the impact of the fees upon those who perhaps need some help and might not get it as a result of a blanket list of fees applied like this. Uh, it's not a matter of, of annulment, but I hope if ministers are considering and reading this report, they will also consider the impact on others of regulations of this nature. Are you suggesting that we write to them? It would be useful just to draw attention to the fact that it might be helpful in any covering documentation if such a as SSI comes forward that some consideration is given to wider issues uh, such as the needs of those who are growing. Graham Day? I just yeah, absolutely endorse it. I think we should write, particularly in relation to the fair trade aspect, because we have taken a, a strong position on that as a government, as in a country, and, and we want to be reassured that these sort of things are considered when we're drafting SSIs of this nature. Okay, we're agreed that we're going to write on the plant health uh, SSI. Right. Um, we have um, so a list of these SSIs, which I think I should put in the record, which is, and they're all SSI 2014, so number 316, number 317, number 319, number 320, number 321, 323, 324, 325, and 338. Are we agreed that we wish to make no uh, comments on these other than the uh, one which we've just done? And therefore, we should pass them. Thank you very much. So we move on to the National Marine Plan now, agenda item four. And uh, we have some witnesses to speak to here. And so our panel today includes uh, David Palmer, the Deputy Director of Marine Planning and Policy, uh, Anna Donald, the Head of Marine Planning and Strategy Team, and Amanda Chisholm, uh, Strategic Environmental Assessment Specialist for the Scottish Government. Welcome to you all, panel, just now. 
Um, we intend to move straight to some questions, uh, but the first one is... Um, I think they would like to make a short opening statement. You think so? Yes. Right, well, we're trying, trying to get to the nub of this matter, given that this is an introductory section. So if you have a short statement for us, it may inform our questions. Um, I, did a, <laughs> I did have a, a, a statement, um, but I will um, cut it back to it effectively... Um, the, the kind of final couple of lines. Um, I mean, it's been a long process in, in some respects, and that's what the, the statement was about, um, filling in the gaps in, in the previous history. But I think um, my kind of final point was I would like to pay tribute to everyone who has um, taken the time and made the effort to engage in the marine planning process through all the, the various consultations that we've had. And in particular, to pay tribute to Anna Donald and her team um, who have uh, worked exceptionally hard um, to deliver what I think is an impressive first for Scotland. Thank you very much. Um, on the basis of that, uh, Mike Russell has a question. Yes, I, I don't think there's any doubt that it's an impressive document. I just want to ask a very simple question. Let me put it in two different ways. The simplest way to put it is, you know, you've drafted this. Who are you writing it for? We know why you're writing it, but we don't, I don't entirely show who you're writing it for. Or if I may put it a, a, a slightly more flippantly, in what circumstances would somebody say to themselves, ah, I must reach for the National Marine Plan? OK, I think there's a range of audiences, um, but its most direct application is in informing decision-making. So it's a, it's a framework for decision-making. So public authorities who make decisions, authorisation or enforcement decisions, or any other decision which affects the marine environment, must do it in accordance with the plan. So at the point where they are looking at an application uh, for a marine licence, or for a lease uh, under the Crown Estate as it currently stands, um, they need to be assured that they are uh, carrying forward that function in accordance with the National Marine Plan. So that's its most direct um, application. Um, as you'll be aware, we're also moving from the national planning framework into the establishment of regional marine plans. Um, so there's an intention for there to be 11 marine regions around the coasts and islands, um, and those plans which they develop on a local basis obviously pick up local issues, but they must also be done in the framework of the national marine plan. So that's its most direct application. I think it also has a kind of broader audience in terms of emphasising the importance of a lot of the issues and highlighting the need for environmental protection alongside um, supporting economic growth of existing and emerging industries. So there's a kind of promotional aspect to it as well, if you like. You see, one of the concerns that I think all of us hear quite often, and indeed we received it in evidence just two weeks ago in another set of circumstances, is that whilst there is a clarity, you know, nobody could deny the clarity, for example, in this document, by the time that has gone through interpretation in local authorities, let alone the iteration of 11 regional plans, there is a sort of cloudiness that will have entered into it, which will all be to do with interpretation by one official or another. And the clarity of what you're seeking to achieve, the ministers are seeking to achieve, the government's seeking to achieve, will be diluted very substantially. Would there be a case for there being less being more in these circumstances to have something that is much, much shorter and simpler and to make sure that that is replicated on a local basis so that there could be no lack of clarity about what should happen? Because I do think, and we'll come on later when I ask you about cables, but I do think there's a situation that could develop where problems will be created by the more words there are, the more interpretations there can be. I think there's, kind of, again, several aspects to that. One is I think there's always more we can do to clarify and have information around the plan which makes it clear about how it should be applied in practice. Um, however, we're starting from a point at the moment where we don't have a planning system. So to me, the fact that we're bringing in this new marine planning system is a step forward to give some of that clarity. Um, Another thing to bear in mind is that the regional plans will be adopted by Scottish ministers, although they're developed by a local partnership. So there's a kind of checking process there whereby ministers will want to reassure themselves that things haven't moved too far away from the framework that was set out. 
Um, and the other aspect worth bearing in mind is that marine licensing um, primarily will continue to be done at the sort of national level through <coughs> sorry, the Marine Scotland licensing and operations team um, who will work very closely to the plan and licensing guidance that accompanies it as well. Um, I think, I mean, to come back to the first part of your question, the, one of the purposes of the document is for any developer doing anything in, in the marine area. Um, we would hope that um, their initial uh, reach would be towards this document to pick up and read it and start to understand the sorts of considerations that, you, that they ought to take um, into account. I think in, in terms of uh, the wider question, the, the document is to some extent all, always has to be written for to catch the, the unexpected, to allow you to catch the unexpected in some sense. The, the, the kind of, um, uh, if you want to put it this way, the, 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 the kind of um, good developer who picks up the document, comes and has a conversation with you, in many respects isn't the problem. It's the people who maybe are at the ends of, of, of um, that spectrum that, that are a problem. And that's how it has to be drafted in order to, to, to pick that up. And to some extent that also presages the, the, the cables conversation that, that we might come to. So I mean, I suspect that, um, it, yes, I think clarity, I'm, I entirely agree with you, clarity is, is always a, a worthy goal. But I think in this instance, what we're trying to do is cover a very wide range of bases. Um, and allow actually or encourage that conversation between the licensing team in Aberdeen and the developer. Um, because quite often, while a developer might have a good idea, that first good idea might not be um, possible. But in conversation with the licensing team, you might be able to develop it in various ways or give them suggestions that, that enable the developer to do it in various ways that might make it possible. No, right. um, I, I was going to say, you know, uh, I suppose you might be saying that if uh, land use planning had been uh, uh, approached in this way as a starter document, that uh, we might have had a better system than we do at the present time. But it's obviously a work in progress on the basis of uh, the need to have a marine plan. So uh, with that in mind, I think we better move to some of the specifics. Cabling has been mentioned. Um, we could deal with some of these matters just as a follow-on from that. So, Graham Day and Mike Russell yeah, want to... Th thank you, Kevin, and, and this absolutely does follow on. Um, we took evidence of the committee from the oil and gas sector some months ago about concerns they had in relation to the fixing of pipelines on the seabed. Uh, specifically, what they told us was that, for safety reasons, they uh, secure the pipelines using large rocks, which may not occur naturally in those areas of the seabed. Now, I think the original suggestion was that you couldn't have those rocks there. That was a concern they expressed. So the question arises, how would you fix the pipelines safely, both to, to protect the pipelines integrity and ensure that they're not a uh, uh, danger to uh, fishing? Um, and I would ask the question in, in that area as to whether this would be retrospectively applied. So if a pipeline is currently affixed in this way, would there be an expectation that that would be altered in some way? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> no, I mean, I don't think there's any suggestion of um, anything being retrospective in that sense. Um, I mean, if, just to refer you to the, the kind of planning policies in the cables part of, of the document, I mean, these have been written in some sense to encourage that very conversation that we've been talking about. And they've been specifically written, um, you know, with those kind of drop down menus you have in mind, you know, um, first and foremost, safety is, is a key consideration, you know. So, um, as it says there, this is talking about cables rather than pipelines, you know, they should be uh, buried to maximise pr uh, protection where there's safety or stability risks. You know, if that's not feasible, then you drop down into. Um, uh, protected through suitable measures, we are practical, um, cost effective, and as the risk assessment directs. So I think, again, what we've tried to do in here is to set out the parameters in some sense for that um, sensible conversation. Um, I don't think it, it doesn't say always and everywhere cables pipeline should be protected, but at the same time, it says that safety is a very key consideration. You know, so we, we have tried to hit that balance between those, those two. And I don't think that to be, they're not necessarily competing forces, but we've tried to balance out the, the, the two different directions, if you, if you like. OK. So to, to sum up, what you're saying is common sense would be applied? <laughs> I would hope so. I would hope so. And that's what we, in some extent, we've tried to draft in, which makes it, it 
quite difficult in some respects. And do you think that will provide sufficient reassurance to the oil and gas sector, who, who clearly felt strongly enough about it to raise it with us? Um, certainly, they, the oil and gas, I, I wasn't aware of the oil and gas sector having a particular problem with uh, the protection of the pipelines, to be honest. Um, certainly, I was aware of other, other cable um, layers having, having some difficulty with the, with the, the cable section. Um, but I'm more than happy to go and talk to oil and gas to make sure that they're content with what we've actually got in the document. OK, thank you, Convener. If I may, then, yeah. just on this, continuing this theme, at the risk of going off at a slight tangent, but um, in terms of cables, um, I know there's been some work done by Marine Scotland looking at the potential impact of the electromagnetic fields that would be generated by cables from offshore wind and how that might affect migratory fish. As I understand it, that's been quite inconclusive. So how do you, or, or perhaps I'm wrong, how would you proceed on, uh, on this? Um, electromagnetic, uh, um, the science is a bit beyond me, to be honest. Um, but only certain cables, certain kinds of cables, will actually generate electromagnetic fields. Um, and I, to be fair, I can't remember if that's basically transmission or distribution. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but an electromagnetic field um, is, a, a, as it explained to me, a distance function. So it, it deteriorates very rapidly over a couple of metres. Um, so in any sense, if you uh, bury that cable, that will reduce the electromagnetic field in the first instance. Um, as I understand the research, it suggests that, um, certainly of the species we've looked at, there's no great Im elect impact from electromagnetic fields on those species. Now, we can say with um, certainty that that then extends to all fish who might be sensitive to electromagnetic fields, but um, I think the evidence we have suggests that it's not going to be a problem. But I'm, I'm happy in some sense. I know we've done bits and pieces of research uh, in the lab in Aberdeen. Um, I'd be happy to get a list of that research and, and send it if that would be helpful. Thank you. That would be useful. That's fine. Uh, and Mike Russell? Yes, I mean, I suspect you expect me to, you will expect me to raise the Dura Cable issue with you, and I'm going to because I think it's, as an exemplar of the issue, I think it's a, a concern, and I, I don't get reassured by what I've read in the cable section here. For those who aren't familiar with it, the, the submarine electricity cable to Dura feeds both feeds Dura Island Coral say, failed six months ago. It also takes electricity out from renewable generation. It has taken six months to get replaced, and it's taken six months to get replaced because... Marine Scotland's licensing appears to me to have been confused, and the SSC were not keen on burying a cable, as they'd never buried their previous cables, whereas fishermen wanted parts of that cable to be buried. Now, that could be simply the start of a new regime, but it does seem to me that if a body that needs to replace an emergency cable, it's not about high-level you know, planning lots of cables places, it's a practical thing that needs to be done to serve communities, take six months, um, what's going to happen in future? Because it seems to me paragraphs 14.4 and 14.6 and onwards have tremendous high-level objectives, but they don't actually deal with, I've got a cable, I want to put it down below. It needs to happen quickly because people need electricity. How do we go about doing it? So I'd like to know your response to that, and I'd like you to tell me the optimum time, or the optimal time, for getting a replacement cable in through a licensing regime? Um, <coughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure that the, the actual licensing process is necessarily the subject. I mean, it's, this is about the National Marine Plan, not about the, that particular license. Um, nonetheless, um, I think there was... Uh, the cable broke. Um, as I understand it, the um, power supply was then dependent on the Bowmore power station, backup power station on Isla. Um, which was um, a reasonable source, if not a, a wholly um, um, complete source. Um, we explained to SSE the policy position, effectively, that our presumption was that cables would be buried. Um, they took the view that um, they didn't want to bury the cable. They made an application uh, after, I think it was two months, um, so it's not six months, it was about four months from the application forward um, to uh, lay the cable without burial. We um, put the um, cable, uh, that application, out to consultation. Um, our statutory navigation consultee, the Marine Coast Guard Agency, came back initially and said the cable should be buried. Um, after discussion, they came back and said that the cable should be buried to a depth of 50 metres. 
uh, at either end, at either shore end. The fishermen um, didn't want partial burial, they wanted complete burial through the, throughout the length of the cable. Um, clearly, if your statutory consultee says it has to be buried at, to, up, out to a 50 metre depth and you have a significant stakeholder saying it, has, it requires uh, complete burial, um, there are some difficulties with that application. Um, if I remember rightly, the total process took about four and a half months to get to a, um, licensing, um, a, a license being issued. Um, we then took steps to ensure that that license was actioned um, as quickly as possible to get the cable in um, within the weather window. Um, quite apart from that, um, Cabinet Secretary uh, agreed that we could dispense with the pre-application consultation, which would have taken 12 weeks um, prior to the licence. Okay, I think you may have inadvertently made my point for me, given that this is, you know, you've gone through a very lengthy process there. Tell me how the National Marine Plan would improve that. Um, I think the National Marine Plan sets out a, a, a clearer background. I mean, I think at, at the start of that process, it, it, it came as a surprise to SSE that cables should be buried. Um, and that took um, a level of communication between ourselves and SSE in order to sort that issue out. Um, and I think what the National Marine Plan now is, it sets a completely, a, a reasonably, um, actually I think completely clear context within which SSC believe they can work. We've also got other issues, other work ongoing with SSC on cables, um, but not, not necessarily relevant to the National Marine Plan. You see, I, I just, just want to press you a little on this point. My constituents, and the constituents I think of all of us around here, you know, in, in rural or island areas, will judge anything the government does on the basis of their lives improving. Um, and they're, where they live improving. Now, there's a high-level improvement in the sense that burying cables is better than leaving them unburied in terms of marine safety, uh, probably in terms of environment, though there are some issues with plumes and, and other things of that nature. But that being the case, I don't actually see that this, you know, replacing a cable that fails uh, is going to be any quicker and whilst, you know, you may not think that the generator in Beaumont is inconvenient, I assure you, I'm happy to lead you to the man who lives next door to it, you know, who found it extremely inconvenient for the six-month period, um, and also the fear in the community that should it fail, there was no alternative source of supply. And in an island community in the middle of a winter storm, that's quite a problem. So tell me how my constituents, the constituents of all of us, how their lives are going to be improved, either through this issue or through other issues with the marine plan. Um, in terms of this issue, um, partly because of the, the, the clarity with which this now puts the cable issues, it's quite clear what the drop-down set of considerations has to be. Um, so anyone coming to uh, the Scottish Government for a licence will be perfectly clear of what the policy context is and perfectly clear for what uh, conversations they should be prepared. If they don't want to bury the cable, they need to have a fairly strong justification for why they're not going to bury the cable. I think the other point here is it's not simply about safety and it's not simply about the environmental impact. It's also about network security. If you bury cables, the actual network that cable supports is very much more secure. So the likelihood of your constituents on, on Dura uh, having um, the cable broken in the future is very much reduced. So there is a whole balance of things here that need to be considered, and that's the balance that I believe is set out in the Cables chapter, and that's the balance I think will enable um, faster decisions to be made. But the proof of the pudding ultimately will be in the eating. Okay. I would just add to that, um, picking up on what David said, it, it's given that kind of rounded clarity and protection, so you, you're clear from the outset, and all stakeholders are clear from the outset what the process is and how their interests can be fed in, because it, in that particular case, it might be of the utmost importance that the process is as quick as possible, but it's also of equal importance that it's safe, it protects network security, it considers environmental impacts, etc. So it's, it's setting out that kind of rounded framework from the start so that everyone's clear about that and how they can represent their interests within it. So speed is potentially one benefit, and we would certainly hope that will prove to be the case. But I think the fact that there's a clear um, route in for all the other interests is, is equally important. Will you consider listing the exemptions? Because if I were a developer, I would say, let's try an exemption out and see what happens. So will you issue guidelines on what exemptions might exist? Can certainly consider that. Yeah. Uh, Alec Ferguson. 
Just a very brief question, which I think maybe ties into Mike Russell's last question, which is, uh, in my part of the world, if you bury cables, you're likely to disturb unexploded World War II ordnance, much of which then washes up on the shore to be picked up by curious holidaymakers, beachcombers, whatever it might be. Uh, how is that sort of localised issue taken care of in the national plan? Um, I, I don't think we... That, that has already been a, a, an issue in some respects, and I think it became an issue, if I remember rightly, because a cable was laid through that area in the late 70s. I, I mean, time scale is a, a bit beyond me. Um, I don't think it... I think we would have to look very, very carefully at any proposition uh, to lay anything through that area. I mean, purely on, on, from the starting point of, of actually safety of getting it on the seabed. So, I mean, I don't think the particular uh, Beaufort Stike issue is, is in this document. Um, but certainly it would have to feature large in, in any consideration of any activity in that area. It's, it, it, it's in in the National normal. Marine Plan, shouldn't it feature in the document? Um, I think, it, I, I think it, it features probably in the, the generality. It's not mentioned per se. I mean, we haven't said Beaufort Stikes a no-go area or anything like that, but it's, I think it's featured, as I say, in the generality that I, I'd need to, I can't find it off the top of my head. But there, there, is, you know, there is this general proposition, if you're going to lay a cable, you need to have some idea of where you're laying the cable and avoid uh, areas of, of difficulty, which Beaufort Dyke is certainly one. Okay. Drafted that policy specifically to highlight the sort of case by case nature of the consideration that's required. Um, so local issues like that would obviously be picked up as part of that consideration. Um, and that's part of the sort of common sense approach that we appreciate needs to be taken. Okay. Um, uh, we're looking at carbon capture and storage because it's linked to this at the moment. Angus MacDonald. Yes, yeah, thanks, uh, Convener. Good morning. Um, uh, going back to the issue of uh, pipelines, uh, particularly in the North Sea, um, if I could re refer to, to Chapter 10 on uh, carbon capture and storage, um, I note that in addition to the, the Peterhead project, uh, Chapter 10 also mentions uh, the other key potential CCS uh, project, which is in my constituency in Falkirk East, uh, the Captain Clean Energy Plant uh, proposed for Grangemouth. Um, now, one of the, the two marine planning policy chapters in Chapter 10 uh, states that the development of marine utility corridors which will allow CCS to capitalise where possible on current infrastructure in the North Sea, including shared use of spatial corridors and pipelines. Could you give the committee an outline of, the, of this chapter um, on carbon capture and storage and explain what a a marine utility corridor is <laughs> um, and what other activities might use uh, such a corridor um, and what the environmental impact might be. And I think the basis of, the, of this particular chapter is really to uh, try and support through the planning process this kind of emerging sector and also to ensure that we are tied up clearly on the marine planning side with what's set out in the National Planning Framework 3 document, because carbon capture and storage is very much an activity where marine and terrestrial planning need to align to enable the, the sector to, to grow. Um, we've had some um, um, information fed in from the sector itself in response to the consultation, which has led to um, some changing around the wording in terms of commercialisation, etc., trying to get a better picture of where the sector is now and where it might go over the lifetime of the plan. Um, in terms of the kind of marine utility corridors concept, that is really looking at what, where there's existing infrastructure to serve oil and gas in the main, um, making the most effective use of that existing infrastructure and operations and maintenance along that existing infrastructure, which could also serve this emerging carbon capture and storage um, sector. Um, in terms of the specific environmental impacts, um, we kind of highlight some of those in the plan. Um, along potential for habitat damage, um, potential for pollution, um, potential for acidification. Um, there's also a bit more detail on that in Scotland's Marine Atlas, which is our kind of main evidence base for the plan. Okay, thanks. Um, you, you mentioned habitat damage. Um, given that the pipelines are already in existence, presumably, that, that would be... Yeah, that's the kind of point of 
where possible using existing infrastructure so that you wouldn't create additional habitat damage. But that might not always be possible. So it acknowledges if there's a new need for new infrastructure, that would obviously have an impact potentially on habitats. Okay. Thank you. Just a question that follows on from this, because I'm looking at uh, the offshore wind and marine renewable energy uh, section. Um, uh, and the map on page 86 of the report shows plan options for offshore wind and marine renewable energy. Um, surprisingly, given the early stages of its development, you haven't marked on this the consented areas at the present time. Um, can you tell me why? Um, this map is really reflecting the sort of outcomes of the process that we went through um, alongside the consultation on the plan. Um, we were also consulting on the sectoral marine plans for offshore wind and um, wave and tidal. So this map is kind of reflecting the outcome of that one specific process. We do um, say on the map that updated data sets will be available on NMPI, which is National Marine Plan Interactive. Um, so that's a, a GIS portal that we host on our website, which contains all the um, all this data, but also all the data about existing lease sites, etc., um, and and has that in different layers, so people can kind of click on and off what it is they're particularly interested in. Sorry, the point about NMPI was in the opening statement. Pardon? The point about NMPI was in the opening statement. Sorry. Yes, I mean the, the, the point about um, why I'm asking is that. Um, I think it's important for people to realise that you've drawn up a plan at this stage with suggested areas. Um, the consents for, for example, Nenner Murray Firth came before that process. So do you think, you know, theoretically, that there would be any difficulties with these now uh, in the areas that have been consented? Um, I wouldn't have thought so, no. Um, it's... I mean, obviously, they've, they've got licences. Um, it depends on the, the kind of detailed work that the um, developers are doing, but I, I wouldn't anticipate any, any difficulties with it. I mean, in terms of uh, the information, um, we could update the map to actually put the existing areas on, if that would, that would be helpful. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd just raise it because, you know, for clarity's sake, when people see plan options, they, they understand it's plans for the future, you know, rather than uh, some things that are already consented. But yeah. since it's at such an early stage um, and nothing has been built yet offshore, barring a couple of small uh, um, tidal uh, machines in place, um, it would be quite useful for these to be reflected. But anyway, maps we have are... To say we have all that information available, yes. so it would be a simple matter to kind of update the map if that was thought to be helpful. Well, it is kind of useful, but um, um, I just wanted to uh, link that to the next thing, which is probably to do with... Um, oh, yes. The point is that uh, the information is changing all the time, and you're capturing this at a particular point. It would be very useful yesterday to see the study from the British Ornithology Trust and the Environmental Research Institute that showed that uh, seabirds, by and large, about 99%, managed to... Uh, uh, change their flight patterns to avoid um, offshore wind uh, towers and so on. Um, is that the kind of thing which you would be able to build into this when you talk about the spatial uh, aspects of the information? Would you be thinking about how far apart um, particular uh, structures should be in the overall plans? I, mean, I, I, I think in, in terms of, it, not so much in, in terms of the overall plans, but certainly in terms of consenting individual developments, um, that sort of information is, is exceptionally important. Um, I think, what, what, in some senses, I think we're conscious that um, the marine planning process, it's, to some extent, ought to be a kind of web-based process, and that will allow it then to pick up kind of um, the kind of incremental work that goes on all the time. Uh, the, the, the paper document, in a sense, is a point in time and will always remain a point in time. Um, so hopefully, uh, as Anna was saying, um, we will be able to update NMPI with new and, and uh, better information as it, as it moves forward, which will give people a better understanding of what we're trying to do. I mean, as I say, in terms of the actual question, um, that was a very uh, interesting study, I think, which um, uh, the scientists at Marine Scotland uh, in Aberdeen ran um, with some interesting results. And um, I think, as I say, that um, 
informed some of the licensing decisions, but I'm not sure it will inform uh, any decision on how far apart the individual developments will be. It, it can inform how far apart the kind of bits and pieces of a development internal to the development will be, but not the developments per se, if, if I've got, if I understood it correctly. I, I'm just quite keen to, but I'm really interested in two other aspects. One, the feeding patterns of seabirds, and two, uh, the migratory patterns of certain of these seabirds as well, given that uh, we can identify major areas in the west coast here. Um, have issues related to the feeding patterns, which we're increasing the understanding of the long distances that uh, some seabirds travel to areas just off uh, Rattray Head, in fact, in the northeast, where is one of the OWNE2 uh, items for potential development. I'm just interested to know if that's the kind of information you've taken into account. I think when, when it it depends if that information was available at that particular point in time. We, we've taken in as much information in, in these maps, um, and I would have, I'd need to go back and look at the, the kind of set of opportunities and constraints um, how, uh, which underpin how these maps uh, were created. And I'm, I'm happy to, to actually share with you how that was done. Um, and if um, it's interesting, I mean, certainly we've got, there's an orth ornithologist in, in the Marine Lab who as I say, was involved in the study you mentioned and has a lot better understanding of the feeding patterns and migratory patterns of birds than, than I ever will have. You know, I'd be happy in some sense for him to come and talk through that study with you if that would be helpful. Well, to know these things, because yeah. we, we are, yes, Anna? So I was just going to say, I mean, I think, as David said, the, the sort of key point is that if the information was available at the point when we were doing the planning process, then it, w it will have been taken into account, because um, all the environmental information that we had that's relevant would have been fed into the, the sort of models that sit behind the, the planning process. And then if that information becomes available at the point between planning and actual licensing, then it'll be taken into account at a licensing point so we won't just say well that's fine you can have a license because you're within that area and that's clear in the sort of first renewables policy that proposals are still subject to licensing and consenting processes um, and that process will pick up any additional information that's become available in the interim did you have a point uh, claudia beamish it's okay Thank you, the moment. It's right. Been okay. right for, we'll go back i think to some of the sectoral chapters um Graham Day, uh, wild salmon, mm -hmm. or is, uh, and anyone else who wants to come in on that part. Sure. Yeah. We're in the sea, so we'll stay in the we'll sea. So the wild salmon. We're, we're completely clear about wild yeah. salmon, are we? In which case, the sea fishery then. Yes, Jim. Uh, good morning to everybody uh, as, as well. Uh, just, just, just very br briefly, really, chapter six on the sea fisheries. There's a couple of issues. It, it says fishing activity has the potential to interact significantly with a number of other sectors and difficult to accurately uh, predict precisely where activity will take place. Uh, and, but it also states there are some key emerging issues concerning the, the interactions between the fishing industry and other interests. It would be interesting to find out what those key emerging issues are and maybe just a, a brief general view on uh, where we're going with the, the, the sea fisheries part of the chapter and some of the key aspects of that. Okay, I think in terms of um, interactions, as you've kind of highlighted there, because fishing is such a kind of widespread industry and activity, it does have the, the potential to interact with virtually anything else which has been planned at sea, um, particularly if that is around the, the creation of you know, physical infrastructure which could uh, potentially um, present a hazard. So I think those are the kind of things that are, are emerging in terms of where is there going to be new activity and where is that new activity going to result in actual physical infrastructure which may have an impact on the safety of fishermen or may disrupt or displace um, the actual fishing stocks themselves. Um, more generally in terms of the fishing chapter and kind of w where we're going with it, um, We've had quite a lot of input through the consultation process around this, um, and it was also an aspect that was picked up in the independent investigation which was undertaken on the plan. So that's led to quite a lot of redrafting of the kind of first three marine planning policies, and that's 
again, quite similar to um, what we were looking at in the cables chapter, trying to set out a kind of staged approach to what must be considered. So your first consideration um, is around, is fishing taking place and can that be safeguarded where possible? So that's your kind of step one. And then your step two is looking at where that might not be possible or where there will be some impact, how can that impact be best mitigated and making sure that you're involving the fishing industry um, in that uh, process of mitigation and developing a sort of an agreed strategy around that. So that's the kind of overall framework that the, the chapter is trying to support. Um, also looking at um, potential impacts on um, fishing stocks so trying to be clear about which parts of the sea are particularly important um, in terms of, uh, for example, nursery or spawning areas and affording protection to those, but also looking at the, the cultural and economic importance of the industry um, in particular areas and what potential impacts there could be on that. So trying to take quite a, a rounded view of um, how fishing may be affected by other activities and how best to, to mitigate for those impacts. Oh, oh, oh yeah, that's, that's really useful. Th thanks for that. You, you, you mentioned there's redraftings al already and issues are, are emerging. How, how obviously we'll come to a stage where well, we've come to the stage that the, the marine plan is, is in the solid uh, print. How, therefore, can we adjust when uh, the plan in, in the future, once we actually find out some emerging issues or s conflicts that may have unintended consequences, perhaps? Yeah, just to, this, just to clarify the comments about redrafting, we're from the sort of consultation draft to this draft. We're not mm -hmm. planning to do much more redrafting at this point. Um, but in terms of how we might adapt and um, change anything, that, you know, in relation to new activity or new science, as we've already discussed, or different interactions that may occur because activity changes, um, et cetera. I suppose there's kind of two, two key things on that. One is the general framework that we set out in all the general policies in the kind of early section of the plan is really trying to encapsulate our, sort of, our view of what sustainable development means and the kind of key parameters that are set out for that. So if, for example, a whole new sector was to emerge that we haven't covered in this plan, um, then it would still be subject to those general policies around sustainable development. So we think there's still a reasonable uh, holistic framework in there that can pick up on issues, even if they're not specifically mentioned at the moment. And then the other point to note is that the plan um, probably has a lifespan of about five years. Um, it's, we're required to monitor and review the plan under both the UK legislation and the Scottish legislation. The timescales for which are slightly different, but the sort of out the furthest away time scale is, is the five-year review period. Um, so there's always that opportunity to build in to review where things are emerging through the process, and we would want to pick that up through monitoring of implementation. No, thanks. That's useful. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, we'll just deal with aquaculture at the moment. Uh, thank you. I, I just wonder if you maybe perhaps summarise briefly for us how you feel the marine plan gets us where we need to go with aquaculture, given the contentious nature of, of, of the subject, uh, the impact that aquaculture has in the areas in which it's located. Um, I think the overall approach here, um, aquaculture is um, an interesting area in that it's currently very much embedded in the terrestrial planning system. So aquaculture consents, et cetera, are currently um, led by local authorities rather than by the marine licensing system. Um, so where we're trying to get to in the chapter is really to say regional marine plans and marine decisions and local authorities and planning decisions need to be taken together, or, or certainly from a common evidence base, um, to look at um, all the relevant issues in terms of location of future development, um, and that the system carrying capacity at a kind of water body or lock system scale should be a key consideration in that. Um, in terms of some of the issues that we know um, people are concerned about in terms of sustainability. We've tried to highlight those particularly within the chapter and point to where ongoing research and development is taking place 
into those issues and, and that that should be fed into these future decisions. Um, Marine Scotland Science are also taking forward a piece of work um, trying to develop existing locational guidance um, to take account of a broader range of potential impacts and also to consider whether there's potential for the industry to move further offshore where impacts may be easier to mitigate. Okay. Yeah. Claudia Beamish. Convener, and good morning to you all. Uh, could, could you say a little bit more, please, some Anna or other members of the panel, about um, aquaculture in relation to ongoing research? You'll know that we took evidence in, in the aquaculture bill in this committee, and I'm wondering about um, whether you've taken into account the um, assessment of the impact of the quite robust um, increases in targets for um, the finfish um, industry uh, in, in your assessments and whether there's going to be ongoing research about that? I mean, yeah, I would, I would echo kind of my, my previous answer, really, um, in terms of we've maintained the targets that were set out in the consultation draft, um, and we think that's important to give that kind of overall context and sort of direction for the industry. Um, as I said, we've tried to be clearer within the chapter about what the key issues are likely to be around that. So more of a focus in the wording of the policy around the carrying capacity, but also looking at um, issues um, around disease and um, sustainability of feed in particular, um, and highlighting in the references the ongoing work that's going, that's going on there. Um, the work that I referred to in terms of the development of locational guidance will pick up on those issues as well. So the kind of outcome of that work will, similar to the kind of renewables planning, we'll be looking at um, where, where's the potential to take forward development, so where, where's water depth, and et cetera, appropriate, um, and then what are the constraints that would prevent development, and those will be, could be some of these environmental issues if we have robust evidence about the interaction um, between farmed and wild fish, for example, that will be kind of fed into that model. Right, I see. So, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but are you saying, can you reassure me that this information, as it's ongoing and as the research develops in relation to the impacts and, in, and the increase in this industry, that that would be fed in, would, is this the, the joy of having the web-based um, arrangement? Could that be fed in so that the criteria could then be uh, changed to some degree, if necessary, either way, yeah, before I mean, the five years? Yeah, it's part of the, it's part of the advantage of having a web-based system is that it's more easily updated and um, current information and research can be fed into that if it's available in such a way that kind of fits the system. So the system that we have at the minute is very spatial. So if you have information or data that gives you some sort of spatial constraint or parameter, then that's quite easily fed in. Um, if the research is kind of more general, then we're, we're developing our website around the National Marine Plan, a sort of National Marine Plan online um, area where we've got all the research that's currently referenced in the plan highlighted and we would add that to you know on emerging research would be added to that website so it would be available um, I think in terms of the kind of actual spatial planning as I said Marine Scotland ourselves are doing a project around that and we would hope that that would become a common evidence base for local authorities and regional plans going forward and would be updated as information came through. Right, thank you, that's helpful. Okay, thank you. I want to talk about the chapters related to recreation and tourism now. Alec Ferguson. Um, thank you, convener. Yes, indeed, and if we could move on to chapter 12 um, on recreation and tourism. And um, the, the chapter seems to a certain extent to sort of focus on the perceived tension between tourism and recreation and other aspects um, of the plan, such as the need to protect habitats and species. Um, and indeed the environment itself. Um, to what extent do you believe that tension is significant? And could you perhaps just discuss a little bit how, you, how the draft plan balances the, the, balances the two sides of that equation, if I can put it that way? Yeah. Um, I don't think I've kind of set this out previously, so just to quickly explain how 
what we've looked at in relation to all the sectoral chapters, which you'll probably realise from reading it. But, um, so for each of them, we've looked at each of the sectors that are covered in the kind of sectoral chapters. We've looked at what is that sector likely to require to grow in an economic sense? How does it interact with other marine users, um, particularly other commercial users? What are the impacts on the environment and what are any climate change <coughs> impacts or um, potential risks in the future that need to be taken into account? So we followed that process through um, for the recreation and tourism sector as well. And I think the sort of key issues coming out of that are really in terms of recognising the importance of the environment to the sector. So a lot of the value of recreation and tourism around the coast and in the sea is based on the fact that it's a stunning natural environment that people want to, to visit um, and want to spend time in. So we've tried to highlight in the kind of policies that kind of win-win situation of um, protecting and enhancing the environment for its own sake, but also because that could then become uh, economically viable through recreation or tourism. So I think we, we've more emphasised that, although we have acknowledged the activities themselves may impact on the environment and that needs to be mitigated for. Um, in terms of potential interactions with other sectors, I think a lot of it is really similar to maybe some of the interactions in the, in the sort of transport or uh, sections, because you're really talking about um, what might interfere with people's access to the marine environment or the coast, or what might pose a hazard while they're using the area. So it's, it's focused around that. I don't think we've pulled any kind of strong policies where we think that is a particular issue. Um, the other thing to highlight is, again, the strong interaction between this sector and terrestrial planning, um, because a lot of the access issues, etc., will need to be picked up in uh, the land use system and make sure that we're joining up between that and what's suggested here. Um, so, for example, we reference the long-distance walking and cycling routes in uh, the national planning framework, and the coastal aspects of that feed through into the marine plan. So and, and just to, to yeah, kind of emphasise that in terms of, of the interactions, while, while there's a kind of aggregate level interaction in some respects between large developments and, and recreation, I think one of the difficulties we've had is that um, a key part of the interaction is actually the sector within itself. There's so many different aspects of the sector. You know, so diving and say surfing don't necessarily shouldn't necessarily happen in the same place for, for safety reasons. And it but it's the level of activity for all these things that is, I think, at this point, at a level where that interaction isn't perhaps critical. And effectively, what we've tried to do is set out a framework that says, actually, into the future, um, as more people dive, as more people windsurf or whatever, these are the kind of factors that you need to take into account and into consideration. It's one of the few sectors, I think it's possibly the only sector, that really has within it that kind of level of interaction, actually, within the sector. Um, rather than between um, the other marine sectors. But that, that, um, thank you. I mean, that, that raises a bit of a concern in my mind, because we have a national marine plan, and yet, as you, you're talking about, very specific tourism sectors, hill walking, walk, sorry, coastal walking, whatever it might be, and you actually list a number of activities and key areas. And, you know, if I'm a completely independent person, which I'm absolutely not in this category, representing Galloway as I do, but I look at the list of activities and I see that recreational sea angling is, um, is very much a key area in Dumfries and Galloway, which it is, um, but very many of the other activities listed also refer to that. And are you not in danger within a national plan of becoming a little bit too specific on local... Mm -hmm. Activities is, I think, what I'm trying to ask. Oh, all I was going to say was I think one of the difficulties we had with um, representing the sector is some of the, there's quite a lot of data gaps um, and a lot of information is collected in different ways that it's, it's not easy to kind of aggregate up to a national picture. Um, we're actually doing some work around that at the minute in terms of how we can get um, better data and more robust data collection methods um, so that that can feed into the sort of next iteration of the national plan but also feed into regional plans so regional plans are very clear about what their local priorities are um, and we 
weren't able to map this this kind of whole sector um, in the same way that we have been able to for the other chapters because of that sort of diversity of activity, but also because there isn't a lot of robust data underpinning a lot of these things. So this is the kind of what's listed there is really a, an attempt to demonstrate the range of activity that takes place, some of the key areas, just to give that kind of overall national perspective. Um, that might be a different way of doing that. No, um, I, I absolutely understand that. But you, you yourself described this entire document right at the start as a framework for decision makers. Yeah. Um, how can you have such a sort of general approach in something that is a framework for decision makers? I'm sorry, I don't mean to be critical, but I, I, this is really raising questions in my I don't, mind. I, I, don't, I don't necessarily think... I, t I take your point as a general approach. Um, I think what, unlike the other sectors, or some of, most of the other sectors, we don't have a lot of information on recreation. There's not... There's not um, there's no real central source that we can go to to get any um, national information say, on diving. You know, we know diving happens in certain places. Uh, we know kayaking happens in certain places, not other places. Uh, and that's really the extent of the information we have. And in effect, what we've tried to do is list the, the, the activity in the area. And effectively, what we're saying to a developer who picks this document up, if you're developing um, in the coast of Dumfries and Galloway, then you need to think about recreational sea angling. You know, or if you're um, for surfing, uh, you're developing in the Hebrides, surfing, um, blah, uh, whatever else, is a key consideration that you need to think about in terms of your development. So it's, it's, it's signposting to the developer that there are issues here that you need to go and look at. But the, but, but the whole chapter, is it not, is about supporting economically productive activities. Uh, I, I just think there's a danger of confliction here. But I, I, I think other members want to come in. So. Oh, sure. That point. Do you want to respond to that point, Anna? Uh, yeah. I, think, I think that's right. I mean, I think that the, the individual chapters do do a couple of things. I mean, as Anna was saying, the, the, the key point in terms of most of the leisure and recreation stuff is actually access. Um, and that tends to be a terrestrial issue, and that's why we flag that for lo the local authority planning system. You know, but the chapters do more than simply promote economic growth in that sense. They, they also put um, the issues of that sector on the map for other developers. Um, similarly, if um, someone was, was um, uh, building a marina, you would expect them to look through the other chapters and see if we are, especially there is important aspects in other in other kind of development areas and go and talk to those developers. So it's, it's, it's and, and that's the kind of general framework that we've, we've tried to provide here. A, to give it some, some boost and then to make sure that everyone else takes account of those individual sectors. Okay. If I can add to that. Um, Sorry, yes. The, the, uh, <laughs> Thanks, Fred. There are key messages here for the regional marine planners as well, and they will have good knowledge of the recreation interests, recreation and tourism interests in their area, as you've already indicated, for example, in Dumfries and Galloway. So the other thing that I think is quite important here and has come up a lot in consultation with, for example, the yachting sector, is that this now requires that development, applications for development consider the implications for recreation and tourism. So, for example, would consider implications for moorings. And we've had a lot of feedback that these issues are not always considered at the right time where moorings are already in place. So again, the message is here that if you are a local authority, you know where those moorings are, particularly in the Western Isles, for example. So those issues can be taken into account. So in a way, that framework works for the regional level. Okay. Just on a point here. So, yeah, j just, just a point of clarity. Um, perhaps for me rather than other committee members. We, we're talking about local authorities and their part in this. Are you satisfied that all local authorities have the necessary expertise to grasp the interaction they need to have with the National Marine Plan? And if they don't, how do they acquire it? I think we recognise that that's an ongoing challenge. Um, and most local authorities at the moment don't have a specialist marine planner, for example. Um, however, a lot of local authorities will have a lot of knowledge about their own local marine and coastal environment, perhaps with more emphasis on the coast in, in some areas. Um, we've looked particularly at the issue of integration between the two systems as a kind of way into that discussion, if you like. 
um, and we developed a sort of draft planning circular as part of the consultation package that was trying to draw out that integration, give more information about the marine planning system to um, existing local authority planners, and then look at some of the areas of potential good practice where there could be liaison and coordination uh, between the two going forward. Um, and we've updated that circular and, and published it alongside the, the redraft of the plan. Um, and, and we recognise that that's the kind of first step, really, and we want to do a lot more work with local authorities, uh, both in terms of kind of becoming familiar with marine planning um, and some local authorities will become directly in, involved in the regional marine plans also, yeah. um, but also about the integration between the two systems. And, and can I ask what initial feedback are you getting from local authorities? Is it one of, yeah, that's fine, that seems sensible, or help? <laughs> a mix? Um, it's probably a mixture. Um, some local authorities, um, particularly in the sort of islands, are very keen to get involved in regional marine planning, for example, and see themselves as the kind of lead partner in those marine planning partnerships in, in the future. Um, other local authorities, it might be more complicated because you've got several local authorities that will all feed into one marine region, and they might be a little less sure. Um, we've been doing some pilot work with... Orkney and Highland, um, a sort of pilot plan for the Orkney and Pentland Firth waters. Um, and there, a member of staff from each local authority has been working with a Marine Scotland official uh, to form a sort of working group to put that plan together. And I think they've found that a very positive experience and are able to bring a lot of their skills and background as terrestrial planners and see how that can apply to marine planning, but also that there are a lot of other things that need to be taken into account and might be quite different. Um, so I think where we've been working closely with people, it's been quite a positive experience, but we do acknowledge that needs to be ruled out um, as we rule regional marine planning out in particular. Okay, thank you. Two more points here uh, from Mike Russell and then Claudia Beamish. I think, Lena, this discussion raises some very considerable concerns in my mind about a point which I raised earlier, and I just want to... to, 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 to push it a little bit. It seems to me that there is something entirely commendable and useful and desirable in having a national marine plan. But when we go into the detail, I mean, I'm looking at page 95, which Alec Ferguson has uh, referred to. When we go into the detail of what activity is undertaken where, and we are endeavouring both on a national level to give indications and on a local level to create regional marine plans, and now I've heard the word regional marine planners, I think we are in danger of creating a cat's cradle of regulation and guidance, which inevitably, the further it is from government, the more restrictive it will become. And I just wonder what thinking is being undertaken in government about ensuring that this is a simple framework for decision-making and is not moving towards accruing all sort of prescriptive powers, unconsciously, which will actually make development and living and activity much more difficult. I haven't heard anything I have to say with the greatest respect today that makes me less worried about that. I've heard a great deal that makes me much more worried about that. And I do think it is important as this moves forward that those responsible for it take that point to the heart of their thinking because otherwise their good intentions will become very, very complex and restrictive at local level. I, I think that's a, that's a fair comment and I, I think we are... Um, aware of that possibility, but I think our general uh, planning uh, principle, um, Gen 1, there's a presumption in favour of sustainable development and use of the marine environment when consistent with the policies um, of this plan. You know, that's the basic driver to, to get, uh, to, to help activity go forward in the marine area. And, but I fully accept your point that the, the superstructure around that might in itself become a hindrance to it. How then do you get the general principles understood as being the things that people should think about and the rest of it should help them to think about it because that's not actually what comes across. What comes across is the general principles are great. Now, let's get on to you know, the detail of page 95. Mm. And I do think there's an issue in terms perhaps of drafting or approach or, or, or uh, promotion 
that will require very, very strong guidance if we are not actually to be bogged down by the infrastructure. I think, as Anna said earlier, the general principles provide the framework within which we would expect everything to, to happen in that sense, and that also provides the flexibility for new activities. You know, we, we, we might not have a section for a new activity, but it would still be subject to the general principles, the general framework. And I think that, as I say, allows the flexibility. I, I fully take your point about the promotion of it, that um, uh, we perhaps need to give more emphasis to the general policies rather than the sectoral um, policies. I mean, the sectoral policies, almost by definition, are always going to be the larger part of the document. We have a lot more sectors than we have the general policies. But as I say, I'm, I'm happy to, to think about uh, and to try to, um, if you think it's worthwhile, rebalance between the general and the specific. I certainly do think it's worthwhile. I think part of the issue comes Sorry. back to the very first question about who the plan is for, and I answered it by saying this, there are a range of audiences. Um, and part of the, the detail there <coughs> is to speak to those audiences and to reassure them that their activity is seen as important and is one that is supported by the planning process. So some of the detail, I think, is necessary for that message. Um, but as David said, the division between the general and the sectoral policies, we've, we've done small things around the presentation, like use the same colour for all the sector policies and then had the general ones as a, a distinct part of the plan. To say, you know, this is, this, is the frame, this is the overall framework and then here's the detail that sits behind it. Um, and I think there's a lot we can do to promote that message more clearly and to make sure that that feeds down to regional planning. But I do think we also need to think about the other audiences for the plan um, and what, what they need to see out of a national marine plan as well. I think in some senses the, the general policies will probably stand the test of time, whereas you'll see significant change in the actual sectoral policies as this process ro rolls forward. So I think, the, if you like, the, the general policies are the bedrock of the approach. Um, and it's, as, as I've said, I'm happy to look again at how that is promoted. OK, it's on the table. Um, Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Kavina. I, I, I'd just like to understand, get a bit more clarity around the um, regional marine plans in relation to their status um, and how that relates to um, local, local planning. Because you, you've said that Sometimes the local authorities will be the lead, sometimes they won't. I went to an evening event last week where there were very positive and robust um, coastal partnerships, of which there are those, as you'll know, right around um, the coast of Scotland, who had concerns about how they would fit in as voluntary organisations, many of whom, uh, whom have been functioning for many years. So there's all those issues, and I'm wondering about what, how people will really become engaged, what the plans are for engagement. I know it's early days, but, and also what the status is. I think in terms of, of the coastal partnerships, it's, um, there are a variety of coastal partnerships, as you say, around the coast, um, and they, they each have um, differences um, in organisation, in approach, uh, in focus, and, and so on. That suits their individual mm. area. And I think we've been conscious uh, through this process um, to try and pick up uh, on the good work that the coastal partnerships do, um, the engagement they have with their local communities, and try to build that where we can into the marine regions. So, for example, um, we have, um, certainly in the Clyde, uh, we've used um, the Clyde partnership as the kind of basis for, for pushing forward that region. Now, that works in the Clyde. It doesn't necessarily work elsewhere, and we don't necessarily have LCPs at elsewhere, but we would certainly see the LCPs, local coastal partnerships, sorry, as providing the, 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 a lot of the kind of community engagement um, uh, infrastructure that uh, a marine planning partnership, a marine region, will actually require. So our approach has always been to try and, um, uh, to some extent, shift the LCPs into the regions where, that's, where they've existed and where that brings benefit to, to both parties, in a sense. So can you just clarify what is the status, then, of the um, regional marine plans in terms of, of actual applications and planning? To what degree do they have to be uh, just, taken into account? Or? Yeah, I was just going to come to that. Um, yeah, so we don't have any yet, but just to be clear... Um, but when, when a regional marine plan exists, it has to be adopted by ministers. Um, and then it effectively has the same status as the national marine plan, but it only applies to the actual region. So it needs to be taken into account in the same way as the national marine plan will need to be taken into account. 
So without wanting to try and make things difficult, there could be a conflict between what is decided at the regional level and the national level, bearing in mind that there are the general principles that have to be taken into account by everybody. But in terms of the detail, there could be... There shouldn't be a conflict okay. because the regional marine plan is required under the legislation to accord with the National Marine Plan. Okay. And as part of the process of adoption by ministers, that would be one of the sort of checks I and see. balances, if you like, that would be being looked at. Okay. Thank you. Well, we'll have stakeholders in after this, you know, where we can explore some of these things. But there's a couple of uh, general points, first of all, on subject chapters on shipping, ports, harbours and ferries. Any point? that you wanted to make, Alex Ferguson? Well, I think just to, to really ask the question that came out of the analysis of consultation responses, which is, um, has suggested that the, or has focused on that the, the, there's a, deg a degree of concern that if you sort of designate certain ports and harbours um, in, in a certain way, you will have a detrimental impact on others. I just would appreciate your brief comments on that. Uh, on that issue that was raised? Yeah, we've taken that into account to an extent um, in how we've reworded one of the policies. Um, yeah, so Transport 2 now looks at a kind of national level and a regional level, I suppose. So we're still identifying particular ports and harbours which are of national significance and they're really aligned with um, those which tie in with national developments or the national renewables infrastructure plans. But then as a sort of a second tier to that policy, we're being clear that regional marine plans should also identify ports and harbours that are significant in their area. So that's how we've attempted to pick up that concern. Okay, yep. Uh, I'm actually interested in that because you, you have produced a national framework and left it up to the regional um, plans to, to pick up on, the, on their aspects, which is rather going back to the point that Mike Russell and I were making, is what I think this plan should be doing. Um, so I th I'm grateful to you for that uh, explanation. Thank you. I've got a, a couple of issues just to ask you about the interaction with um, the Ministry of Defence because the impacts on species, the impacts on sea and land users, for example, on exercises where um, GPS is jammed, uh, the impact on uh, the development of on and offshore wind because of flight paths of uh, training zones all interact with uh, where we're at in the Western Isles. Issues about uh, uh, that related very recently to applications for small community wind farms close to the uh, test range in North Uist. Um, how do you find interaction with defence? Because uh, is the experience out there that um, planning applications that might have defence implications often don't hear about the objection till the last minute? Have you been getting a good interaction with the Ministry of Defence uh, in terms of this plan? In terms of the plan, um, we've been mainly interacting with kind of central Whitehall Department, and we haven't had any particular difficulties um, around that. I don't know if there's anything from the licensing process. That... Um, no, I would need, uh, to be fair, my impression is that um, we have uh, a decent interaction with MOD um, through uh, one of their subcontractors rather than with MOD per se, uh, but I would need to go and check that to be, to be, to be clear and be to, to not mis mislead you in any sense, but that, that's my understanding of it, certainly. Yeah. I mean, I'll make the general catch-all at the moment. You know, if there are things you wish to follow up in writing to us, that uh, we'd be happy to accept that as one of them, and there are other things that emerge from uh, things you've said already. Um, it, it's just a general concern that um, sustainability and many other issues which we're interested in are affected. Um, dolphins, porpoises, these have, you know, there's, there's increasing evidence of the effects of, uh, on them of joint warrior exercises, particularly off Cape Wrath in my constituency. Um, we would need to know that these kinds of things are, uh, you know, being emphasised by the Marine Plan because fundamentally we're interested in the sustainability of uh, the natural environment as the basis for anything that we plan to, to use it for. Just on the issue of noise, I mean, certainly uh, 15, 17 on one, two, three, yeah. 
makes the point that the MOD do comply with the relevant legislation. As far as we're I know that that's the point you make, but um, I'm afraid that uh, you know science is developing, and perhaps there are questions about whether that's adequate. But anyway, um, you know, you've said that there. It's not an immobile situation, but I would hope it would be taken into account. Okay. Right, Tim, I think that's all in sectoral. Just a question to wrap up, if mm -hmm. possible, from uh, Claudia Beamish on more uh, vision and uh, outlook sort of questions which have cropped up in many sections so far. Yep. Right, uh, thank you, convener. Um, in terms of the vision and objectives and principles of the plan, which um, you have covered quite a lot of in, in your um, evidence today, um, I, I, I note for the record that um, the plan's vision for the marine environment is clean, healthy, safe, productive and diverse seas managed to meet the long-term needs of nature and people, which is obviously a big challenge and, and we all hope that the plan will contribute very robustly to underpinning this. Could I ask you, um, in relation to the principles of sustainable development, which are obviously very important here, um, how that relates to one of the, um, the general plan, is it GEN, do you say? Um, how that relates to the issue of enhancement, which is under um, number nine, I think, uh, because it would seem that sustainable development isn't the same thing as enhancement, and I'm wondering how that will be taken into account. There was quite a lot of, about enhancement of the, or, and protection and enhancement in the in the consultations, and it also came up in, I understand, in the sustainability appraisal, which I've had a, a brief look at. I mean, I think that this chapter, so all the general policies are attempting to um, be clear about how we're interpreting sustainable development for the purposes of the plan. So given that, as you pointed out, Gen 9, explicitly talks about protecting where appropriate enhance the health of the marine area, we would see that as an intrinsic part of sustainable development, because this entire chapter, each of the policies represents a different strand of how we're um, seeing sustainable development applying across the plan. So I don't think it's contrary or, or different from sustainable development. Um, and we, we have tried to emphasise it, particularly within that um, policy Gen 9. Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of stated in the policy bo uh, text box itself and then throughout the text which sits under that um, we do mention um, quite a few times that it's not just about protecting what's already there that there should be consideration of the potential for enhancement and that should be taken forward where possible. Um, so we talk about that specifically in relation to MPAs at 4.42 and also in relation to biodiversity um, and associated ecosystem services. And I think in relation to, uh, sorry, that's at 4.58 and then also in relation to geodiversity as well, uh, just under that. Um, so as I say, I wouldn't see the two things as being separate. I think the... Um, consideration of opportunities for enhancement and activities to take that forward we see as being part of sustainable development. Um, we've tried to highlight where particularly we think that that's a, a key issue. There's a couple of other bits in the sectoral chapters, particularly as I um, alluded to earlier in the tourism and recreation chapter, where there's a particularly obvious link between enhancing the natural environment and the potential for that sector to capitalise on that. Um, so that's been highlighted as well. Um, so, so can I just push you on that? What yep. would happen if in, say, oil and gas or, um, or a different sector, um, the developer said, no, it's not possible? You've said where possible. Yep. I mean, in ter you know, everyone could just come back and say, oh, well, it really isn't possible in this instance because dot, dot, dot. And I'm, I'm looking from a, a future um, perspective to say, you know, how will our seas be protected in terms of what you're saying about the needs of nature and people, but also the long-term needs? 
But I think sometimes it won't be possible to enhance. So that, that will be a fair argument in some cases. Um, in other cases, um, we would look at it the same as we look at other aspects of environmental protection at the moment um, in terms of um, our advisory bodies, etc. You know, is there a realistic opportunity there that, that should be pushed through that process? Or, as I say, in some cases, it won't be realistic. But the, the plan has given us the hook to have that discussion with the developer or whoever is bringing the proposal forward. Thank you. And just two other brief points mm -hmm. um, in relation, one relation to sustainable development and one to cumulative effect. In terms of uh, sustainable development, in relation to oil and gas, um, understand that, well, I quote that there's um, an, an aim for the maximum recovery of reserves, and I'm wondering how that fits with um, the movement to a low carbon economy um, in terms of sustainable development. And also, um, I would like to uh, just ask you to comment on the very important aspect of cumulative effect. I know we've touched on it in some of the sectoral discussions, but in terms of, is it um, Gen 21, the, um, the issues around cumulative effect, because that's going to be where there are competing or, or even indeed complementary developments, but maybe too many of the same kind, even something as positive as... as, as you know, the, the local people being involved with tourism for their own future, whatever. How, how will that operate? I think, I mean, certainly in terms of the cumulative impact, it's, it's an emerging area that um, I, I think to some extent we're beginning to get a handle on, um, purely in terms just of the scientific terms of, um, you know, what are the cumulative impacts of a development? And that can be a very prolonged and, and detailed process and a very difficult process. And I think... Part of the problem is that as our understanding of how the marine ecosystem actually works and how the structure and function of that system is impacted by development, we'll actually be in a much stronger position to begin to understand the cumulative impact of, of the, the variety of, of um, developments. And I think that's, that's just an issue for the future. We are going to have to work hard. We can do kind of project level cumulative impacts, environmental cumulative impacts at the moment, but we're not much far beyond that. And it's just going to have to be a process of, of pushing this agenda forward because the ultimately the cumulative impact of all the development is actually pretty key to, to all of this. So it's, it's the agenda that, that we're trying to promote in that sense. And the sustainability appraisal has had to look at cumulative effects, as does it, at project level environmental impact assessment. It's required to do so through legislation. Um, but it's one thing to legislate and another thing to, to do that. And cumulative effects assessment is very much a, an emerging area, as David said. So we did a lot of training courses. There's a lot more experience. We're getting better at doing it from all aspects of the different environmental assessments, including you know, habitat regulations appraisal, which is a definite requirement there. So it, I think it's important to, to bring this to the attention of developers, decision makers, <coughs> and the regional marine planners, just to remind everybody that these are key areas, and um, particularly because so much of the activity in the marine environment requires that the quality of that environment to be continued. Right. Situation. Yes, go on. Sorry, this is the first part of your question about um, oil and gas. I mean, I think our position on that is quite clearly set out in the sort of background and context part of the oil and gas chapter which is basically highlighting existing Scottish Government policy, supporting a move towards a low-carbon economy and inherent within that, moving from fossil fuel-based energy towards renewable sources. But given that the reality is oil and gas are set to remain a vital source of energy in, in the time while that transition is taking place, then the Government thinks it's sensible to secure reserves from within Scottish waters as far as possible. So that's, we've tried to set that out more clearly as a, as a result of that issue coming out um, quite a lot in the consultation <laughs> responses, um, but it's really reflecting existing policy on, on both those aspects, both the transition and how we use the reserves in the interim period. I'm just highlighting that it says, as I understand it, maximise recovery of reserves. So perhaps that's a question for me to ask to the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the witnesses for all their evidence. Um, uh, you've offered us some more detail on certain points that were raised there, and we would welcome these as we take forward this discussion with stakeholders and uh, ministers. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Um,
As uh, we have agreed earlier, this session will now move into private. But before I close the meeting, at its next meeting, the 1st in 2015, on Wednesday 7th January, the committee will take evidence on the draft National Marine Plan from stakeholders and consider a Public Bodies Act Consent Memorandum on the abolition of the Home Grown Timber Advisory Committee. Uh, I'd like to note on record the committee's thanks to all of those who have participated in meetings throughout 2014, stakeholders, Scottish Government ministers and officials, the clerks, the SPICE official report, uh, broadcasting and security. And I would like to wish everybody season's greetings at the moment and I now ask to clear the public gallery. This meeting is closed in public. <laughs>